Okay, I'm delighted to be joined by former Peace United striker Danny Crow. Danny, first and foremost, you staying safe? Yes, I'm trying to, yeah. Um, trying to keep a routine. Well, set a routine, got a little girl, so we tried to get a routine. It's hard when you, you know, leave your job and things like that and you've been furloughed. So um, both me and my wife both have been furloughed. So um, getting that routine and just trying to get the odd jobs done around the house, really. Um, just trying to keep active. I want to talk about your, your time, obviously, at Peterborough. Um, can you remember how the move first came about, how you ended up at Peterborough? What, what was the, the memory of the, of the negotiations and all that kind of stuff? Um, I remember when I was at Norwich at the time and Norwich sort of said to me that I'm not going to be... Um, I felt I had a year option, but they said that, that there's other players here that are ahead of you, so go out, see what other clubs you can get. And... I remember, I think it was Barry, made contact, uh, contact with my agent and um, I ended up like wanting to go have a look, to be honest. I wanted to have a look because I didn't really know too much about the football club, but I went there for a day in pre-season. Uh, Mark Wright was the manager and I really enjoyed it. The lads was brilliant and it sort of like just evolved from there, really. Um, agreed a contract, I think it was like a day later um, and then... You know, the, the rest is sort of history and I joined there and I was really happy. Um, I was 19, 20, leaving home. Um, well, I say home, I was in digs, but leaving, you know, sort of area you grew up in Great Yarmouth and Norwich. Uh, I moved to Peterborough and got a flat and, yeah, I remember it when it when it all happened, I was really, really excited. Yeah, was the fact that the location, obviously not too far, although Norwich and, and Great Yarmouth is, is quite a trek from Peterborough in terms of there's, a, there's only one road in, one road out. But obviously, yeah. in terms of location, was that important to you in, in, in those negotiations? Um, I think it was. There's a few other clubs, to be fair, that was made uh, contact with my agent. But I think as soon as you meet someone like Barry Fry and someone like that, he just he's very good at talking and he just made me feel very welcome and just he praises you and makes you feel like you're going to do really well under like his sort of regime, even though, even though he wasn't the manager, he had a lot of say in what was happening at the football club. Um, and just like how he sold the club, he didn't really have to sell the club, but his sort of ways and what he, way he wanted Peter United to go um, in them couple of years excited me and um, I just brought into it straight away. So I don't think it was location, I think it was more kind of meeting someone like Barry Fry for the first time in my life and thinking... Uh, I, I really like you, I respect you after just meeting him for one day really. Yeah, because it was obviously a big change at the time at the football club because obviously Barry had been manager, Mark Wright was his the first appointment after that and obviously Mark had come with um, a big pedigree and obviously he, he wanted yeah. to sort of change the style. How did yeah. you feel training was in the early part of your time at, at the football club under him and obviously Blio as the assistant? It was a lot different, it was um, obviously you go from, I went from Norwich like as a uh, I was a pro contract there and you go from having like sports scientists and all things like that to just Mark Wright and Leo taking training. So it was very regimented, very old school, but it was actually really good. I look back now um, and even at the time, I think I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, Mark and Leo had a relationship um, at that time and, you know, there's both fun guys. Um, you, you worked hard, you run. Um, very old school, like I say, through the forest and things like that. But I, I really enjoyed it. I really liked it when I first met them too. And then I see how training was going to be in that pre-season, playing a couple of games, scoring a few goals. I really believed that, you know, we could achieve something that year. Did you have a target in mind in terms of goals? Because any young striker going to a new club will probably think to themselves, like if mm. I can get, get 15 by, say, I don't know, December, January, I've got a real chance of scoring yeah. a bucket full of goals. Do you feel that you had the opportunity to score quite a lot? Um, yeah, you do. I think when you had them players like in and around you, like even you know the attacking sort of players, when you had Adam Newton, um, like Jamie Day coming through, Ryan Semple, um, you had Peter Gain centre mid, all very creative players. And I don't know if Quinny joined when I joined, but he joined a bit later. And you had Richard Logan. You you really see a threat. But I'll be honest, I didn't know much about League Two football, but I see these players and was thinking, you know, that they're, they're very good. You know, going from like you know, Premier League footballers um, to then going to League Two, like people might look, turn their nose up and things like that. But I was very surprised and very like excited about what could potentially happen. Um, scoring goals, I've never really put pressure on myself, really. Um, 
I think like when one goes in, obviously as a as a player, you're just very confident the next one that you're gonna you're gonna score. But you have a lot of chances in teams like that, especially you know League Two, where um, I think defenders sometimes you know you fa- you do fancy your chances and not be nasty against League Two sort of centre half, but you fancy your chances almost. You know you're gonna get more chances than just one. Mm. Um, so I probably. Didn't think I'd do as well as I did, to be honest, in that first year. Um, I, I don't think I didn't envision that, to be honest. I thought I'd be a kind of bit part player because um, I think Logie was there for a while and they got Quinny in. Um, so I thought I might have been a bit, but my aim was to try and just get in the team and maintain my place. Yeah, in terms of the goals you scored um, before we get on to obviously mm-hmm. Mark Leaven and Leo coming in, the yeah. goals you, 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 I suppose you were more of a instinctive striker you probably wouldn't score many from outside the box you were someone who'd obviously run on to balls in behind yeah. or being a sort of yeah. box in the box is that how you would describe yourself I think yeah I think so I think like when when I was always growing up there's always like centre forwards when I was younger like who was probably better technically than me um so I had to you know I tell young people nowadays like especially footballers like, I just worked so hard just to try and get in a team. And I knew, I used to work every day like on, on scoring goals. Like I think it was A.D. Boothroy, he was my youth team manager, and he said about being a, a fox in the box, I think he used to say. And that's sort of, I used to practice just balls bouncing in the 18-yard box and just shooting. Um, I never really scored many worldy goals. Um, but I think, you know, like Michael Owen and Robbie Fowler, just knowing where the ball's potentially going to go and anticipating that, I was... You know, my, early on my career, I was, I was very good at that. Yeah, Mark Wright's departure um, came as a shock to everybody, I think, at the time. Mm. Uh, Steve Bleasdale was put in charge quite quickly after that. As players, mm. how did you feel about that transition in terms of how you thought it was going to happen? Did you think that that would be a natural sort of fit in terms of what he was already doing on the training ground? I, I think you sort of... I think you, I don't know, you sort of knew that... He was a, he was a good guy. Leo was a good guy. Um, obviously, everyone knew Mark Wright was the boss. But you know, in training, sometimes I'll, I'm sure if you speak to some of the lads who was there when I was there, um, he used to kind of not mug him off, but say little things about him to put him down. And he was just a good guy, Leo a Scouser, like just a really nice guy. And then when he kind of took over, um, and obviously the, the club was in a massive transition from the, that period with big role manager and things like that. So he come in and was he thrown in the deep end? I'd probably say yes. Um, but, you know, I think the lads all sort of knew what we could do that year. And like you say, Mark Wright leaving was a shock, but I know what happened behind the scenes and it, it wasn't really. In terms of, um, obviously, as Blair took over, the documentary was already in the pipeline because yeah. back in those days, obviously, the club was, was desperate for the money. And yeah. um, it, was, it was kind of uh, um, unheard of that there'd be a documentary of that sort that would be involved in yeah. football. When you first heard about it as players, what, what were your initial thoughts? Well, Barry Fry came in. I remember we was all sat in the, uh, the changing room at the football ground and he came in and basically said, this is what's happening. If you don't like it, you can leave. But the club basically needs the money. Um, so this is what we're doing. Uh, it's going to be a documentary on the football club um, until the end of the season. So, you know, you have to kind of just accept that. You know, it's Barry Fry walking in. He, he runs a football club and it is what it is. I was young, maybe, and didn't really know too much about it. Like you say, nowadays, there's a lot of sort of documentaries, but didn't really know how big or what was going to happen until... You know, the film crew turned up and Ron turned up and it was just a bit, it was very bizarre. Um, so as youngsters, I think it, you know, me, Sean, Pasty, Semps, Hughie, Adam Fry, like it was sort of surreal. Whereas I think the older boys knew what the crack was, if, if you know what I mean. Um, they knew, I don't think they realised how big it was going to be, but they knew that it could play a part in not helping us really. And I do think that did happen. Did you did you feel that the um, not I suppose the cameras were a distraction, but it, it became a little bit about too much more than the actual promotion push. Do you know what I mean? It was more about um, mm. what was going on behind the scenes. I think it was. Yeah, I think I, th- I remember. It. I think it was outside the playoffs, and I think we was all playing uh, quite well. To be honest, um, 
it was a it was a very surreal experience when like obviously I don't Leo was you know a big part of it and certain things happened towards him and I felt he was he he got not made not he how he was portrayed wasn't really how he was it was very hard with Ron Ron liked all the youngsters so Ron liked myself uh Semps Sean he really liked the youngsters but then Leo had a click with the older ones and he sort of had like not looked after them it, it, there's a lot of clashes it was I think it affected the group massively like I don't I, I don't ever think there's a divide I always got on with everyone at the football club but I think like some of the older boys didn't really like what was going on and we me and the others listen you might have to speak to them but I'm talking about myself I was a bit naive to what was was happening yeah, how did you find uh, Ron Atkinson? I mean, as I say, he always appeared in the show, watching it back, that you had a good relationship with him, you were listening to him, he, he obviously had a lot of experience. Did you feel that it would be pointless not to try and listen to what he had to say? Of course, yeah, he was he was brilliant. I, I you know, I really, really enjoyed getting to know him and what, what the centre forwards he had worked with and how he sort of helped them become better players and he really gave me some good advice. Um, you know, I think that, sort of went against me a bit, if I'm honest, with how Bleo sort of saw things. And, you know, I think it was, I, I, I'll be honest, I've never really watched it back. I don't really, I don't really want to, but um, I really liked working with him. I, got, I, I felt like I learned a lot from him. Um, obviously, his, his knowledge is like superior in the game and he helped me, he helped, he focused a lot on the youngsters, I think, as well. So, um, you know, I, you know he, he was a good guy. I've got, I haven't got a bad way to say about him. I remember the, I think it was the Berry game away from home when um, Kasper Schmeichel went up for a, a corner yeah. and obviously the ball broke and you ended up running uh, from, yeah. you know, from halfway line to putting it in. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that kind of goal was, was, was obviously a brilliant moment. And obviously, Blio then nearly got in trouble, I think, with the supporters. Um, yeah. And then yeah. the dressing room after, I remember well, watching it back, looked like it was bouncing. Did you believe at that point that regardless of what was going on, you could get promoted? Yeah, I think so. I think when things... You know, I think when we went to Bury away, I, I can't remember what the scores. I think I scored two. I think it was three one or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, and I remember. I remember like during the game, we was everything. Everyone was playing really well. You know, there was a there was a um, sort of spark that everyone sort of was buying into and was passing, was working well. And I wouldn't say it was necessarily Bleo's tactics. It's just that we had some very good players there. Um, so to get that result, and afterwards, it was. Everyone was buzzing. I remember everyone been, everyone was really, really happy with the result, how we performed. And then I remember Ron sort of pulling, I think he pulled me or he said something to me. Or as soon as he would come in, the sort of atmosphere would sort of drop. Not from the youngsters, we were still buzzing, but I, I, it did affect so much. But does that, did that play a part in us maybe not going up? You know, it, it could have done or was we just not good enough? Mm. I think everybody um, talks about um, the, the, there was a ruckus in the dressing room that was obviously yeah. caught on camera, but that goes on in every single dressing room up and down the land, doesn't it? Did, did, it's hard, man. I, I guess that, you know, from from a player within the dressing room, you would have looked at that yeah. footage and thought, well, that was inevitably going to happen. Does that, yeah. that happen quite a lot, I guess, during your career at other clubs? Yeah, well, to be fair, that's not the first time. And even even when I was young, during when that happened, I remember it happening. Um, it, it, I weren't surprised that it happened because of you know, the emotions that were running high. I think we lost the game as well. Um, and was it, it was Cardi and Arbs, weren't it? Was it? Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, the other ones involved, yeah. Yeah, so obviously they like they were like seasoned pros at the time and obviously it's emotions with football. You just lost the game, you're not exactly going to be too happy. And I think it was Sean, was he banging his boots? I can't really remember. Um, so I think... It, it riled, it riled people up, um, but that is football. I think everyone just wants to win. You know, we all wanted to turn up every day. We want to get promoted. As soon as you lose a game, things like that do happen. Whether I agree with it or not, I don't. It's nothing to do with me. But if them boys wanted to have a, have a little tear up, what, what can you do? <laughs> Let's um, let's talk about the the day that Bleo Bleo quit because um, I yeah. remember that vividly. I, I actually saw Bleo that morning. I went around his house to to drop off the set of pieces that I'd printed out, and obviously, yeah. um, unbeknown what was occurring. When you were in the dressing room, 
Yeah. Um, what was going through your head at the time, uh, just beforehand, and, and what did you think straight afterwards? Well, yeah, that's people always bring that up to me, like still to this day about when he quit. That I, I sort of laughed. And it wasn't, it wasn't that. It was very unexpected, to be honest with you. It was preparing, preparing, preparing for a game. I think we had Macclesfield. I think it was mm. when I was looking back, and I remember waiting for him to like sort of name the team and. Um, you, you're waiting and he just sort of just kind of like quit now I don't know what happens behind this I didn't know what was going on with himself and Barry and Ron and all that sort of stuff but it was very surprising uh, to say the least and my sort of reaction to it was I can't believe what is going on here like that's what it was it wasn't me laughing that someone just lost his job because that's that's not the sort of person I am um, it was just sort of like bit of shell shock to be honest with you mm. um, and then as you can see Barry wasn't expecting it like yourself you, you was giving him the tactics in the morning and set pieces like you say so it was very bizarre sort of situation and I wasn't expecting you know Leo to do that and I, I, I felt sorry for him like really like when you sort of look back at the time when it was all happening as, as we said earlier I think he was kind of thrown in the deep end and especially with cameras like that, that was, yeah, it could, must have been very hard and stressful. And of course, we went on to win that game 3-2. You scored in the last minute to, to yeah. secure the win. Um, I mean, yeah. it, was a, it was a very surreal day, capped off with a very mm. surreal finish. Yeah, it was, yeah. I think that's probably the furthest I've ever scored out. Yeah, I think I was about 20 yards out. So, um, yeah, it was, it was nice. And I think, like, in the day, you're at a football club to win games and we still wanted to get promoted so bad and I think we had a bad, bad run um, and I think that was quite an important game. I don't know if it kept us in or what. Yeah, kept it kept us in it, and then we went to Orient and, and obviously got beat <laughs> and needed a miracle on the last day against Wickham. Yeah, so yeah, I think it was an important goal and you know, it's why we was all there for them sort of moments and trying to believe and that we could make the playoffs and things like that and yeah, it was... <laughs> Whatever happens before, like it is what it is. Like you say, people fight. I've been involved in change rooms at half time, and people will have a fight, and you sort of get the hair dryer treatment and things like that. But you're there to win games, and I think everyone's as one on the football pitch. Yeah, obviously that season didn't end in the promotion. Obviously, the the following year, Keith Alexander came in as manager. There was a lot of change again. It was almost feel a little bit like transition was happening over and over again. Um, what do you what do you remember about that following season? Um, I remember we went to we went to Ireland, and he was he was more old school than uh, Mark Wright. He I can't remember his assistant's name, but he, he was. I didn't really see eye to eye with him. Um, to be honest, I think the way he wanted to play football wasn't sort of how it how it got the best out of the players we had. Um, so he obviously wanted to go more direct. He brought in like people like Ben. Ben Futcher and Butch Yeo and people like that, all brilliant, brilliant lads. I think that was from Lincoln. Mm. Um, so he wanted to go more direct. I remember the pre-season we was training and he called it Huffball or something like that, or his assistant did. And I was just kind of thinking, I don't know how this is going to sort of play out. But obviously you try, you try and buy into it because he had success at Lincoln. You know, he kept getting playoffs and things like that. So you obviously thought it was going to work. Um, but... Once again, all the lads come in. It was really good atmosphere in the football club. I don't think it helped during the, I think it was the pre-season or whatever that the that programme come out. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously he betrayed me to be trouble. Um, but whether or not he, he changed his opinion on me, I, I, I don't think he did. And that, that was the hardest for me to adjust to someone that sort of didn't judge me for me, just watched me on a telly when he didn't know really what was going on. Um, like I, I think you knew me well enough and I always loved my time at that football club, whereas I got on with all the staff and I think when someone comes in and judges me from maybe that TV programme, that was a bit of, bit of pill to swallow. Um, but I tried to win him over. I think I don't think I started. Actually, I don't know. I think we won the first game, Bristol Rovers, didn't we? Mm. Um, and then I think I sort of fell out of favour, um, kept scoring the odd goal here and there. And I think that's when the major transition sort of started happening. And I think his way of football 
the fans and the players didn't really buy into it, to be honest. Yeah, you, you mentioned, obviously, that it affected Keith's view of you from that TV mm -hmm. programme. Do you think without the TV programme, we'd be looking back on, a, on a, a better career for you, perhaps? Yeah, it's always something I do think about. And um, it is hard. I, I think, like, back then I was, you know, I was young, I was hungry, I was doing really, really well. I think that programme come out and I do think it did affect um, sort of me as a person and me potentially going out, not elsewhere or potentially moving higher. Um, I do think people have judged me. I couldn't, you know, I went out, I was walking around, I remember shopping once in Manchester and people were just shouting at me like, don't, no, what was he shouting at me? Um, when I say battle, you mm. battle. I was thinking like, what, what is this? I didn't realise that it, it was going to be that big, to be honest. Um, every time I played a football match, it's all my defenders against me would say mm. you're a little you're a little yeah. you're this you're that because they've watched that and they didn't know me as a person but I don't know whether they knew that would wind me up because I I was portrayed sort of not in a good in a good way so to speak but you know that program I've never spoke about it I've never no one's ever really asked me about it but my thing is is that no one kn know what was going on obviously they were seeing that thing that made good telly didn't it you know <laughs> people Love the programme, but yeah, I, I do think that stopped me progressing. Yeah, I do. Because yeah, your actual goal record for the club was, was pretty good, wasn't it? I think you, you mm. were pretty, hovered around one in three, one in three and a half, mm. which is for, for any striker, particularly one of your age. Is, yeah. you know, if, if you equated that to now and look at the strikers, yeah. you'd probably get a, a move off the back of it. And, and yeah. as a consequence, I, I guess you probably look back with a little bit of frustration that you, you obviously went, you were hovering around League Two from there on in. Yeah, it was, yeah. And I, I felt like I could have, I think there's a few bids that come in um, before that programme come out. Uh, Barry didn't want me to go, which I fully respected because I, I loved that. I loved playing there. You know, I left there and they looked after me and, um, you know, I, I done well. You've got to remember that first year, I got player of the year, I think I was 19, 20 years old. Um, still scored about 20 goals. Um, it was a good return for some of my age and considering... For the last four months, we had that program that you know might, might have stopped us all kicking on. Mm. Um, I'm not saying that I could have done better, but you know it, it's one of them where I still got player of the year, and even though I was portrayed like a little bugger, yeah. I still I still done well and got player of the year and top goal scorer. Yeah, and and your career after that, obviously you, you left. Um, I think Darren was the manager when you left. Yeah. Um, obviously, yeah. as I say, there was obviously players coming in left, right, and centre. Yeah. Point. You feel it was. Yeah. It had to be the right time for you to try and forge a career elsewhere. Um, I didn't really at the time. I remember, like obviously Keith left. I'm not sure when um, Darren took over, but he sort of took over from the. Um, I can't remember what it was. Sorry, um, but you you did see that transition. Obviously, then Dara um, becoming part of the football club. Um, you signing these players from non-league. You got Aaron McLean, George Boyd, Mikel Smith. Um, and then Heidi, Shane Blackett, you had some, some lads who you didn't really know too much about, but you could see that there was a good player. Um, and the squad down created was very, very good. Training was probably like the best I've been involved in, to be honest. It was so good, the tempo, the standard, how the club was running was, was brilliant. And I think I still played a bit under Darren when he first come. Um, but then I think... It wasn't long before like his sort of way of playing, his philosophy, the players he signed at the time. Did I think them players were better than me? No, but I look back now and yes, they were. Um, you know, you, you always got to believe in yourself as a football player, but as soon as he's bringing a lot of football players in, especially attacking players, um, I think then you sort of knew that he was getting pushed out. Um, I went back one pre-season, I was in good shape to be fair. Um, but he sort of said you were the under twenty threes, no, no, under eighteen. So I trained with the under eighteens, and you know I think then obviously left the football club. And that, it was hard. It was hard. Looking back now, it took me about probably a year to get over it. Yeah, you obviously, played with, you obviously played with some good players um, during that time. You mentioned a few of them there. I remember Pete Gain as a player that had so yeah. much ability and mm. was probably a little bit unfortunate playing in League Two because I think the higher he would have gone up, the better he would have probably got. What was he like yeah. as, a, as a player on, to play with and on the training ground? Um, Gainey was a great, great lad. He's obviously 
your London boy, um, brilliant, brilliant lad. I think it's Kilburn, I think he was. And like some of the things he done in training was unbelievable. You know, his left footed, close control, passing, scored goals, fit. Um, and like you say, it was good players. And he he was one that stood out, you know, in training. You see what he was about and his football in brain. Um, he was so good. I can't I think he played obviously in there with Paul Carden. Carden obviously was I think they uh, complimented each other well, whereas Cardi would rat around and Gainey would sort of join the attacking players. Um, so even like my first year there, when you had Mark Arbour and people like that, Richard Logan, Quinney, people like that, there was a lot, some good players and the football club was was a good football club to play for and I'm, I'm guessing it still is now, you know. There was um, obviously a few players that came in and around that time. Obviously, I remember Chef Kikuchi coming and playing, what, 45 yeah. minutes of football up front. I guess from, from a striker's perspective, you never really had a, a regular partner. I know Logie played up front a bit with you. Yeah. He, he always seemed to pick up a few injuries, didn't he? So you never yeah. really had that yeah. consistency of performance. Do you think if you'd have had a regular partner, that would have helped mm. as well? Yeah, I was trying to think about it early. I think it was... I think it was me, Richard Logan, Callum Willock, and I think it was Quinney. I really liked playing with Quinney. He was a more of an experienced player and obviously he played for Northern Ireland. So you learned a lot of him. And I think he was someone my first year that I enjoyed playing with. But then Logie was, was brilliant. But like you say, he got injured quite a lot, didn't he? So, um, yeah, it was always sort of mixing and matching. And then the second year, then you had um, Simon Yeo up front and he was... I didn't really know how he... We didn't compliment each other very well, to be honest. Um, so it, it was trying to adjust your game to get used to how he played. But it didn't just didn't really happen. And then when Aaron McLean came, I, I felt like that was a good sort of... A good partnership. Um, you know, he's good in the air. He knew what I was good at and I knew what he was good at. And I think we did click, to be fair, then a couple of months. And I, he was someone I really enjoyed playing with. You know, I didn't spend a lot of time playing with Craig Mikel Smith, to be honest. So I think it was more... Um, Aaron McLean and Mikel Smith ahead of me so they played a lot together um, but a, that club has always attracted good, fo good football players and especially strikers and mm. I think it always will I don't know how Barry and Dara do it but they always do it <laughs> well, If you were sort of to look back on your um, career at, at Peterborough United what, how, do you, how do you think you look back on it do you look back on it with um, sort of satisfaction that you scored the goals that you did or, or frustration mm -hmm. that perhaps you didn't score more? Um, yeah, you always want to score more. I always wish I scored 30, 40 goals a season. I always wish that. But I think my first my first year there was probably, you know, I've, football was there's a lot of highs and lows, but th that year I, I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed everything about it. I loved it. Um, my time at Peterborough, I, you know, looking back now about a big wrong thing but I still enjoyed it during that period you know um, I have regrets that you know leaving and not sort of maybe adapting to maybe Darren Ferguson's more how he was way of playing um, you know but was I good enough to say potentially play in his team I don't think I was looking back but I think you always have regrets sort of over your career and wish you scored more goals or stayed at this club for a little bit longer but my time at Peterborough, I think the worst thing I'd done was probably go to Cambridge, you know, the, the, their arch rivals, you know. Um, but that was sort of, I didn't really have many football clubs after the big Ron manager programme come out. So um, I've, my fond memories of Peterborough from the first day to the last day I left, I walked out there, my head out high, shook Darren's hand, shook Barry's hand, you know, and I, I was happy. And just finally, what would you say to, uh... A 19-year-old Danny Crow now, knowing what was going to come in terms of the program and all that kind of stuff, what would you sort of say to a 19-year-old Danny now? Ah, uh, good question. Um, I would say keep focused, focus on yourself, um, accept that there's cameras there, you're going to be watched at all times. So just be more aware of what's going on and be more mature in that sense. Um, but always have a smile on your face and always just enjoy playing football because you'll always, I'll always score goals, you know, when I was young and uh, very confident.